We're very happy to have our very own Kate Story Fisher, who is a graduate student working with David, um, to talk about cosmological quasar catalogs. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I wrote everyone else's name, but I forgot to write my own. <laughs> Um, I'm Kate, I'm a final year grad student, or Tinker, um, and I'll be talking to you today about um, some of our recent work on constructing a quasar catalog for cosmology from uh, Sky and Unwise, among other things. Um, and this is work in collaboration with Todd, Hans Walter Ricks, Christina Eilers, Abby Williams is here, and Julia Fabian at GCA. Um, so, so this is their, their work. Um, okay, so briefly, uh, my outline, what I'll be talking about. Um, so I'm going to first talk about why you should care about quasars and why they're useful for cosmology, what they are. Um, I'll get into Gaia DR3, data release 3, and how it gave us 6.6 .6 million quasars to play with last summer. Uh, quasars are in quotes because it's a mess of a sample, and so a lot of work has gone into making this catalog from it um, using unwise and for survey. Um, using SCSS, with redshift, and modeling the selection function, which is uh, slightly complicated. Um, and then I'll show a preview of some cosmological results. So as a warning, this talk is pretty heavy on the kind of astro and technical details, um, and I'll give you a little hint of some of the cosmology we're doing with it, but this is about the catalog and structure of it. Okay, um, let's get into it. So, these are... Uh, so quasars refer to um, extremely luminous AGN, so active galactic nuclei, um, which are black holes at the center of galaxies, supermassive black holes that are accreting lots of gas and dust, and that makes the torus around the black hole. Um, there's often also jets coming out, and there's also gas clouds around that get, um, absorb and re-emit uh, to give us emission lines in our quasar spectra. Um, and because these are so luminous, you can see them really far away. Um, so let me just write this. This is uh, luminous AGN. Uh, and um, they, because supermassive black holes are at the center of almost every galaxy, these are at the centers of galaxies. And why is that interesting? Because then they end up tracing the large scale structure, so the underlying distribution of matter in the universe. Um, and compared to galaxies, there we can see them as observed, say, um, at higher redshift uh, because they're so bright. Um, so they can outshine their galaxies by up to a thousand times at max. Um, and so the nearest one, because they're also more rare, is at the 0.04. Uh, and the farthest one that we've seen was in 2020, as of 2021, was at redshift 7.6. We may have higher redshift ones now from JWST. Um, and What's the name of the quasar at 0.04? <laughs> I, I don't know. It was found in like 2015, I think. It was pretty. Wait, that's not true. It was like there was written about it in 2015. Uh, I don't know the name. I think it's 3C. something. Oh, is it 3C273? Yeah. It might be 3C273. It's a very bright radio source. Yes. Um, and compared to galaxies, they're also very highly biased. Um, so that means it's a, a biased tracer of the uh, matter field. So it appears um, only, they appear in um, higher peaks of the density field. Um, so it traces this, the extreme overdense region. So uh, to give you a sense, at uh, Z of one, it's got a bias. They have a bias of around two, whereas galaxies are more um, around uh, 1.3, the very bunch. Um, and then uh, they get more and more highly biased as a function of redshift. Um, are they really, also more highly biased when you go more luminous? Are more luminous quasars more biased? It's, than... Yeah, they're both strong luminosity and bias dependent that are uh, both a function of redshift. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, because of these properties, um, we can uh, do um, interesting cosmology with them compared to other types of tracers. Uh, so they we can see them at really high redshift, so they span really large volumes, um, even though they're lower number density than galaxies, um, we can still trace out the large scale structure with them. 
Um, so some things we can do cosmologically. Um, uh, well, first, this kind of a, a prereq or related to cosmology, but a little less so, is that they connect um, galaxies to their dark matter halos and to and to the black holes they host. Um, so they're really useful for understanding the, the life cycle of galaxies and black holes, as well as the connection to dark matter halos and the mass of dark matter halos to host quasars. Also useful information. Um, and then we can uh, look at how they cluster. Um, so their power spectrum or two point correlation function, and that gives us a lot of cosmological information. We can learn things like the growth of structure. Uh, the, the Hubble distance, the Hubble constant, um, other cosmological things we're interested in just from their clustering. Uh, they're also really useful for cross-correlating with other uh, all-sky surveys, uh, for example, the CMB, um, because they uh, are observed across such a big redshift range, we can get a lot of interesting tomographic information from quasar spike across them with things like um, and finally, they're really useful for understanding um, the <coughs> homogeneity and isotopy of the universe through these properties I mentioned before. This is something that Og and Abby have been thinking a lot about, and if we have time at the end, I'll talk a bit how we go about this. Um, but uh, given that I've been around here long enough, I know we never get to the end of the brown bag, so I'm going to give you a little preview of some of these results in case we don't get there, and also to motivate why you should pay attention to the rest of the talk and care about constructing this catalog. Um, so one result I'll share here is this cross-correlation with CMB. So this is work led by Julio Fabian, um, and he's working on a cross-correlation of our catalog with CMB lensing. Um, so that's the um, distortions in the light coming to us from the CMB because it passes through uh, the large-scale structure in between. So that's correlated with the actual large-scale structure we see at lower redshift. Um, and from that, we can measure things about the cosmological model. One of the things we can measure is, um, or constrain is primordial non-Gaussianity, um, which is the deviation from Gaussian fluctuations in the primordial density field. And uh, Julio has gotten from our catalog a constraint on this parameter that um, emphasizes the primordial density field, FNL. Um, to about 20. And this is um, as good as the recent EBOS uh, 3D clustering analysis um, and better than some uh, other cross correlations of the CMB with photometric quasars. Um, so, with our kind of uh, accidental quasar catalog that we made with Gaia, we're able to do it as good as uh, the EBOS quasars, this massive uh, survey. Um, so, just to get you interested, I'll show you how we end up there. All right. Um, okay, let's talk about Gaia. Um, okay, so uh, the Gaia mission is a spacecraft, a space based mission that um, is observing uh, all point sources in the sky up to some limiting magnitude. Um, so it's been running since 2016 ish, um, it just released DR3 in June, um, and it observed uh, 1.5 billion point sources uh, up to the limiting magnitude in the G band of 21. Uh, so that's a huge number of sources. Most of those are Milky Way stars, um, but in observing the sky, also uh, observed a lot of extragalactic sources, which is how we ended up with our quasars. Um, and so Gaia is meant to have really high precision astrometry. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to write this anymore, but it measures the RA and depth of objects. May owe a dollar and uh, things like the proper motion on the sky, the parallax, um, as well as the uh, magnitude in a few different bands. So G, EP, and RP, a few different colors. Um, and not only does it give us colors, but it actually gives us uh, low resolution spectra. So um, it has uh, the counters here. Uh, we just talked about writing this properly, but this is something like look. Um, and we get a low res BP and RP spectra, which it might not look as nice as 
a few years do, but um, still give us a lot of useful information about the sources. Um, and so how do we get from this to uh, our uh, catalog of uh, quasars? Um, like the point that as I mentioned before. Um, so one of the, the Gaia units um, did a whole bunch of work uh, trying to learn which of these uh, sources were actual quasars by training um, on labeled data from SDSS, uh, so mostly. Um, so it tries to figure out, um, based on this set of information, um, I'm whether- sorry, did the SDSS see the same billion points? Uh, no, so <coughs> SDSS is only in one patch of the sky. Um, or a couple patches in the sky, whereas Gaia sees the whole sky. So in that sense, it's not overlapping. Uh, and SDSS can have different selection effects than Gaia in terms of which sources, which in terms of their color, et cetera, that they observe. But was so. it also what the billion points in the sky? This is DSS thing? Uh, yes. But a different billion. But it is, yeah, it was more like three or 400 million, but not including the galactic plane. And so when deeper, in a in an emptier area of sky. Because I don't know, I mean, I, I, I know nothing, but it seems like you are observing the same points again and again and again with different uh, <laughs> with, with, with different surveys, right? Are you an that, yeah. that, yeah. that is that is that is astronomy. But it's true in some sense, right? It's just different, uh, how to say it, observational strategies, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Except this is more sky, way more sky. More sky. Uh, and the location of the seashore. Yeah. Different, yeah, different, different strategies. So different they get spectra different. of a much larger number of objects, they cover more sky, they're a little, they're somewhat shallower, but. We're going to take away your astronomy card. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it does make an interesting point because we're trying to learn things from SDSS, but it's not necessarily the you know, same selection of the samples. So we might be imprinting some of the things from SDSS on our, uh, on our selection. Um, but we're still going to them, and so we're going to try to figure out whether something is, or if Gaia did, whether it's a quasar, a galaxy, a star, also there's some small classes like white dwarfs and binaries. So this big pipeline tried to classify every single source into one of these. Um, and it has a lot of information in the spectra as well as these other properties about whether uh, a source falls into one of these categories using some fancy machine learning models mostly. Um, and then there's also some other information that other um, <coughs> modules or models try to or use to try to learn um, these classes because Gaia um, has some extra information on top of this. One of the things it has is uh, time dependent measurement. So um, it scans the sky multiple times um, from 10 to 100 times per source. And so we can get um, observations of all the objects as a function of time. And quasars are known to be time variable sources due to their uh, gas exceeding around a black hole and that being a time variable process. So we also have a way of trying to tell whether it's quasar from the time variability. Uh, another piece of information we can use is the surface brightness profile. So our quasars are in the centers of host galaxies and that distribution of this really bright source with the faint host will have some particular profile um, and that can help us learn of source it is. Um, and finally, Gaia does use some external information by this is my Gaia catalog by cross correlating it with other surveys like SDSS, for example, um, and uh, catching quasars we already know exist. Um, and a lot of these quasars are what's actually used to fix the Gaia uh, celestial reference frame, um, the inertial reference frame, which allows us to uh, calibrate the rest of the measurements. These are all the ways that, uh, which Gaia, in which Gaia tries to learn which um, objects are quasars. Um, so does that mean that, does Gaia really use some of these quasars to set its zero of its reference frame? Like the, yeah. so this is the, these, these, that's why quasars were important to Gaia? Yes, but all the ones that I think it actually uses in the reference frame are also observed externally. They yeah, don't have right. Gaia yeah. Only quasars. yeah, yeah, they're very carefully selected, yeah. I think. So what we end up with 
is um, 6.6 .6 million Quasar candidates. That's why I put it in quotes before. And on the sky, it looks something like this. I'm going to now draw 6.6 .6 million. <laughs> um, but it is, um, that was Abby's joke, by the way. Um, it looks something like this where you have fewer quasars in this region, more in these regions, um, and this is the galactic plane in the center. It looks just like Herschel's picture of the galactic plane. Thank you. <laughs> <It> really <laughs> <does>. <laughs> um, And a lot of this is because um, there's uh, a lot of other stars and stuff in the galactic plane that's crowding out our view um, of the distant universe. Um, also, there's a lot of dust in the galactic plane that is um, blocking stuff or changing its uh, color that makes it end up not in our sample. I'll talk more about these selection effects and how we deal with them later, but that's why it looks like that. We also see when we just plot their raw sample that we have a whole bunch of quasars here, quasars here and here, which we don't think there's no really intense groups of quasars uh, in random patches of the sky. Those are the LMC and SMC satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Um, so we suspect that these are a lot of stars that have snuck into the Gaia sample. Um, they intentionally make this sample um, that they give us super uh, complete to catch everything that might be a quasar, but to have low purity, uh, or they know that'll end up ha having low purity, which they estimate to be about 52%. So like half of these, they are like probably not quasars, um, but they're in here for us to learn which is which, depending on our analysis. Um, so one of our metrics we're going to end up using is um, if these uh, nearby galaxies end up disappearing from our quasar sample. Okay. Will so you when, compare it? Sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Will you compare it to previously existing quasar catalogs? <clears throat> yes. It's coming. Okay. It's coming. Um, but better in some ways. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, when they made this very very high completeness, low purity catalog. Was it because they were imagining that somebody like you would come along and clean it up? Is yeah. that explicitly stated in Pretty the Pretty much. It says it would be good to add in IR photometry here to improve this, and that's exactly what we did. I see. So you're doing God's work. Yeah. <laughs> Gaia, you are crazy. Yeah. Um, they do actually um, give you a query to try to select a higher uh, purity sample here. Um, based, which is like kind of changing the thresholds from the output of their ML modules. Um, and you, so you can get a pretty high purity sample there, but you end up with the like whatever selection effects from their modules imprinted a bit more. Um, so we try to um, improve this or make it more pure in a way that's a more understandable um, and reproducible than a CPU. Um, okay, so. Um, Gaia um, gives us a lot of awesome information about these quasars, um, but some of it is a little harder to deal with than other things. So I'm going to talk about the redshift a bit first before I get into cleaning this up. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, we get these CPRP spectra. Um, for the quasars, um, but you might be more used to seeing a quasar spectrum if you're if you like looking at SPSS data that looks more like this. Much higher resolution, you can really clearly see these spectral lines. Um, so what happens here when we're trying to estimate the redshift of uh, quasars is that you'll often end up with um, like only a single emission line in your band. So this is some emission line, say we end up with H alpha here. Um, and guess it's redshift. But some of the time, uh, that's not actually H alpha, it's uh, some other line like C3. And so uh, we're gonna get the redshift totally wrong. So this is the issue with the Gaia's low red spectra is that, um, well, when it's right, it gets like decently precise info. Sometimes it's super catastrophically wrong. So. I mean, you've drawn these overlapping BPRP spectra, <laughs> but they don't have the same value where they overlap. Is that because you're drawing some uncalibrated yeah. version of the spectrum or something? Yeah, I'm just showing them so we can show them at the same okay. place. They're really, yeah, right. It looks more like this in terms of the relative. Okay, got it. It's not a distribution of spectra. It's a single spectrum. This is a single spectrum, a function of wavelength. Yeah. Yeah. 
guy estimate this 52% purity using like mock catalogs or something? Like how did they actually come up with that number? They estimated it in a very complicated way that I went back and forth with the author of this paper about um, that has to do with um, putting some prior estimate on the relative number of expected quasars and stars and then also using uh, your some known held out sample um, of known quasars and stars on your module and seeing how many you miss. Um, and that's also some complicated uh, mix of all of these ways of doing it. So these all have different purities. So if you only use the spectra plus the astrometry, it's only 24% purity, but these other ones are more pure. So yeah, it's more complicated and such. Um, so what ends up happening with the redshift is if we plot, um, so what Guy did, what we do also is we cross correlate a portion of these with Sloan somewhere. I'm not sure where it is. Um, Sloan's most of that top region. Yeah, yeah okay. There's a few patches up here. Um, and uh, can get some true redshifts, which are uh, Sloan relative to Gaia is spectroscopic, nice spectroscopic redshifts based on um, you know, this really high res spectroscopy that we trust it more. Um, I think it's like. 98%, 99% where as, um, these redshifts I will show you are much worse than that. Um, so this is the uh, error on the redshift, which is um, oh, actually, no, that, that was right. Gaia does this in a particular way for this plot. Um, which is the error on the guy redshift compared to SDSS. Um, so at zero here, um, it does get a bunch of redshifts correct. This is just log number. Um, but if you will also see that you also have a bunch out here, and then up here, and up here. So these ones are all correct. These ones are a bunch of ones that are wrong by the same amount. Um, and that is because of what I mentioned before that uh, this one, for instance, is uh, the line was actually a C4 emission line, uh, but it was misidentified as Lyman alpha. And you can identify for each of these. So what is it? Your badness is a function of redshift or something? Uh, this is just a histogram of badness. So zero is very good. Out on either side is bad. And just number of objects that are that bad. So you have some very crazy selection function. So this isn't from the selection as much. It's because of the no, no. But I, but I mean, so your your error is a very complicated oh, function of yes. a redshift, which perhaps makes your catalog unusable. <laughs> That's what Lance said when we first started doing this. Um, but we have complicated about this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so it has complicated selection effects. But a lot of this we can fix by bringing in external information, which Guy couldn't and didn't use. Um, so you can break some of the degeneracies here of these lines using uh, information at other wavelengths, which is what I'm going to show you. You still end up with some of these peaks, but you... you but it's like, this is the real issue for you, right? How to fight this thing. This is one of the real issues, one of the main issues, yeah, with many of this. I will say, there, so there's a anal cosmological analysis that you can do that depend less sensitively on redshift than others, right? If you want to do 3D clustering, you better have your redshifts pretty good, but if you want to do a cross-correlation and raw redshift bins, it's okay to have some error. People do this with photometric uh, redshifts all the time, which are worse than these because we do have low resolution spectral information. Maybe a way to first understand the issue. What if you integrated under everything that wasn't in the central peak? What fraction is that of the central peak, yeah. just numerically? Yeah, I was about to write that. Dennis. Um, so we have 64% um, of um, of objects with uh, Z Gaia, which I write this in, Z Gaia minus Z true, so the absolute redshift error of less, uh, of is, great, yeah, is less than a point one. So that means 36% are uh, catastrophically wrong. This is in what Gaia produced. Not this, in is in the full, this is in the full Gaia catalog. Not in, so I'll first, I'll, I'll next tell you about the cuts we make that will help a little bit with this before we even attempt to improve the metrics, so. Um. By the way, this issue here is the issue for the future of large-scale structure, because everything in large-scale structure is moving to intensity mapping, you know, like sphere X and stuff, and everything is like, or, or um, 21 centimeter things where there's all sorts of confusing lines. 
So all future large-scale structure missions are going to see superpositions of large-scale structure at different redshifts. That is the future of large-scale structure. Do you really see a symmetry between these peaks around the zero? Uh, they're not exactly symmetric, but they are quite symmetric. I don't, I don't know if there's a good reason for that because, like, this one is. Isn't that Lyman alpha as no, carbon four? No, it's not. Four? That's the thing. I like. I no. feel like it should be, but this one is C three <laughs> as magnesium two. Yeah. So. The, the, the sequence of, of strong lines is disturbingly close to geometric. Yeah. <laughs> And the same number of peaks and left this is also a that's long space. That, so that when little... you see two or three, you don't know whether you've seen some shift. Anyway, but go on. No, you see the same number of peaks in left and right. <coughs> same symmetry. It's the... not exactly the okay. same number, but the, in the main ones, it does look finally symmetric. Principle. <laughs> that, that is actually not allowed. <laughs> Our deck really is don't. fine now that you can find like like black holes and small you know <laughs> small halos with them. But <laughs> anyway, go on. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the Gaia redshift distribution um, of these of these redshifts, C Gaia, um, looks something, this is just the non sum normalized number, um, looks something like 0, 2, 4, 6, and 3. So you might notice that this is not a really nice redshift distribution like we might hope for our quasars and like we model theoretically or see in other surveys. Um, for context, like SDSS looks more, for EBOS, like a nice clean selection of SDSS looks more like this. Um, so it's a mess. Um, also, we have a bunch of these high redshift quasars that, um, from our analysis, we don't think are actually these five quasars because those are very rare and that would be pretty surprising if there was that many. <laughs> mostly wrong and incorrect, uh, basically all of them in our sample. Uh, okay. Uh, and the other thing we can look at for the Gaia sample is the magnitude distribution in G, um, log number. Um, and here, uh, the survey limit I told you was 21. We actually see some things down to like nearly 22 because of messy observational stuff. Um, I don't know what is G. G is a magnitude in a particular band that covers a wavelength range of. And so we have a bunch of <coughs> quasars peaking around uh, here, um, falling off down to this, uh, falling off down this way, but also Guy observes uh, these as quasars. So probably we don't have magnitude 5 quasars because that would like outshine the sky. Um, if they were right here. So we don't think these are probably quasars, um, not quasars. Um, but we also know that at this uh, faint end, there's a lot of more issues with our catalog. So this number um, gets a lot worse if you uh, look at it in bins of G. And so um, you get a lot worse redshifts down at that magnitude, same magnitude. You also get more imprints from the Gaia selection function because you don't observe these faint objects as um, often. So we, for our catalog, put a um, cut in G at G of less than 20.6, which gives us a little buffer to 20.5. Um, so already cutting these out um, helps a lot. It cuts out some quasars, not I mean, a good amount, but they're not particularly useful for cosmology. So that helps us um, with a lot of these metrics. Um, the other, another quantity that Gaia measures is the proper motion, um, mu which is, we can measure it in units of milliseconds per year, which is the motion of an object on the sky um, in our Iranian deck. Uh, quasars, so uh, stars will be moving around, so they'll have some reasonable proper motion. Quasars are super far away. They set the reference frame, as I said, they should not have any proper motions. Of course, they have some small proper motions due to observational effects, et cetera, but most of them um, are quite <coughs> small. Um, so 
most of them are uh, below. So around a little less than one is like the, um, the Gaia uncertainty at the, the limiting magnitude of our sample. Um, so that's just an error reference to show you. And most of our quasars fall like in this area down here. Um, but there also is a population in this catalog that looks like this. Um, so these are pretty obviously not quasars with these huge hover motions. So what we do is we add a cut here, guided by known FDSS quasars, um, to cut out this population and only grab the ones that are not moving really fast in the sky and are more likely to be quasars. Right. So these are all the kind of pre-cuts we make on the sample before. It's the funny that Gaia didn't make that cut because that's an internal cut they could have made it. They use hover motions in their predictions here, so in theory, some of that information was used, but not a direct cut. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, now we want to do what Gaia was not allowed to do, which is bring in external information to try to improve some of the uh, choices to go into an improved catalog. Um, so we cross match our sample with unwise. Um, so wise, uh, uh, you know, there's a acronym. It's an all sky survey in the infrared, in the near infrared, um, that um, observes. Uh, many, many sources, actually more than Gaia, observed around 2 billion sources. Um, and so when we, uh, what we did is do a cross match of all uh, Gaia quasars that are within an arc second of unwise um, and find that there's about uh, 1.5 million of the quasars with, um, with wise information. Wait, sorry. There's you guys have invented the name Unwise, am no. I correct? Oh, um, Wise is the name of the survey, and Unwise is a reprocessing of the catalog that has improved measurements. And then you, okay, which is something you're using. It's which is a catalog, an external catalog that we're using that was created by Dustin Lang. And so not all of our sources are in there, um, but around a quarter of them are. Um, and. Uh, the ones that are end up being the ones we care about more anyway. So, uh, and W1 and W2 are magnitude bands in it, red. Um, and that's going to help us uh, learn which of these objects are actually quasars. Um, one of the ways we can do this is by plotting the color distribution of these objects. So sorry, do you understand why some sources are missing in this unwise? I mean, does it make sense that they are missing? Is it something you have expected? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, they probably have different selections in terms of which things are visible in the infrared. So it's but it would, some wouldn't it make sense to kind of have. understand why what, exactly what, does anyone water? else here know? Yes. <laughs> I mean, most of the things that don't appear in WISE will not be quasars, because as Kate's about to tell you, quasars tend to be bright in the infrared. So almost everything that falls out of this will not be a quasar. Right. So already doing this magic cut out a lot of the like stars and stuff that were accidentally. Oh, you, but, 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 why is, but half of your catalog are quasars. So half of yeah, your no, quasars, no. Well, we half of whatever we, reason, not observed but, by the yeah, sun. No, I agree. One, one okay. way to think of it is you look at this, a star, a star at 21st magnitude, a red star, or any star, which will be red at those wavelengths. My guess is that if you, if you follow the Raleigh Gaines tail down to W1, it's below Wise's limit, typically. Right, so it still is there, but it. Yeah, yeah that's my. Yeah. That would be my. Yeah, see. So, well, makes but I yeah, you should believe, definitely check. But I personally right. don't believe the thirty-two percent number. I really think we're getting most of the quasars through this cut because. I so I, I think that as Kate said, that fifty-two percent number was not trivial to calculate, and I think it could easily be off. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about this. I do, we probably threw away some quasars, but I doubt we threw away many of this. Quasars are really bright. Could you just repeat the number? I think I didn't assimilate it properly the first time. Which number? This one that, the 52%. Uh, so yes, 52% of the oh, quasars oh, okay. in the million are probably That's not the quasars. unwise discussion. Right, unwise discussion is 1.5. But like naively, I expected to get 3 million. 
when we went. Because of this 52%, I expected to get 3 million at this stage. We got 1.5. Because then why should preferentially start with quasars rather than stars and the other contaminants that are in the. You've gone yeah. down three orders of magnitude. Uh, from 2 billion no. to 1. No, sorry. This is just the total number of wide sources. Right. Um, this is the cross match with the, oh, so with the Gaia right. quasars at 0.6 million. So we're only down by a factor of. Within the same set you already started with, it's not too independent. Yeah. And this is also only, it's not, it's like a little more than a quarter if after we do the cuts on proper motion and magnitude showing that a lot of those would, we're cutting out the same objects. And um, so if we uh, plot in color, color space, so the difference between these magnitude bands gives us the color, so this is the IR color, and then we can also bring in the Gaia band uh, and difference it with uh, one of the <clears throat> wide color bands. Um, we see here's like zero, zero, six, four. Um, we see that uh, quasars tend to fall in a particular region here. Kind of has that shape. Um, and we can see this by plotting like the SDSS known objects um, where they fall in the color color space. So most of these are. Quasars, so they're redder in both of these colors. Um, the bottom. G minus W1, okay. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, stars will be mostly around here having zero color because they're black bodies. Um, stars, um, galaxies will fall somewhere around here. Um, and then Magellanic Cloud stars, which are a galaxy but made up of nearby stars or have a slightly different distribution around here, um, which we ended up needing to deal with um, separately as well. Um, we can also just look at the Gaia colors, which the Gaia team already used information, but somehow there's we think, better cuts to do in Gaia color space. So this is PQ minus RP and G minus RP. Um, quasars are around here. Uh, this color space um, where there's a bunch of galaxies that are in a very different regime of color space. Stars <coughs> tend to be around here. The Magellanic clouds actually overlap a lot with the quasars here, so that explains why it's, it was hard to separate in just uh, Gaia colors, which is all that Gaia had. Um, and so what we end up doing to uh, use this information um, is kind of choosing a few uh, reasonable cuts. Um, so we kind of look at broadly where we need cuts and then we optimize them. Um, so we end up uh, including a cut in W1 minus W2, which is probably our, our most powerful contribution because uh, Guy didn't have that information. We also cut in, w, in G minus W1. We also find that we need a diagonal cut here because of the Magellanic clouds are <coughs> infringing on quasar space. Um, and then we also try to cut out this galaxy population here. Um, so these are the four cuts we make in color color space. Um, we like choose some like a loss function to optimize to try to get in the most amount of quasar as well, uh, excluding the highest amount of these contaminants, um, and we end up reducing the number of contaminants from our superset of objects that have wide information and the other cuts I mentioned by a factor of four. Um, so we're able to clean out a whole bunch of these. While, um, while only reducing the, um, the number of known quasars that we exclude with these cuts by uh, 1.2%. Uh, that means that 64% number is more like 90% or... When contaminants, you mean large delta Zs. Oh, no, sorry. In this case, by contaminants, I mean objects that are known to be non-quasars. Oh, I see. Okay. Which also probably have weird delta Zs. Right. So okay. this already helps improve our <laughs> oh, okay. red got it. but nice. this is just okay. yeah. uh, source type contaminants. What do you mean known quasar quasars? I thought you were trying. You don't know. <laughs> so these ones that I've drawn are SDSS quasars, which are we're using as our like tr ground truth classes that are confirmed objects. So how do you confirm? Like how do you like uh, we have really good spectra and 
humans are. People looked at every spectrum. They were. Literally, humans looked at every spectrum. However, <laughs> it is true that there's no gra true ground right. truth here. Yeah. There are probably classes of quasars that we've killed. Yeah. It's so, possible that some of the SDSS known quasars will be killed by a future. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In principle, yeah. So in principle, there's no ground truth. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, if you plot this in our uh, our sample, you see like distributions that look kind of like this. Like you can kind of pick out populations of objects that are probably these contaminant samples, and then we test those out. So. Actually, Injun Zaw and um, I'm not be able to say the first name, and I made a much lower redshift quasar. Uh, a gen catalog, and we found problems with the SDS mm -hmm. ones. There were definitely some that shouldn't be there, and some that were there. Yeah, that's a different. Yeah. So those are really the EGN, right? right? So that's doing the yeah. narrow line EGN. Yeah. So well, narrow line, but in any event, I think but, it's you know, know, fair to say that it's the no, no. Yeah. There's no ground truth. No, yeah, yeah. yeah that, those it's pretty sad. Pretty sad. Give us a job. Well, we'll so. send, we're going to send. Uh, Zoltan to the nearest quasar <laughs> to check it out. <laughs> no, but I mean, they say confirmed, right? Like uh, a phase spectroscopy fell <coughs> up and it's confirmed, right? Mm -hmm. Still, there is no ground truth after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we even, some of these really high redshift quasars, we got excited when the catalog first came out. We did like some cleaning to try to choose some that we thought were more uh, possible and compared them to SDSS, and we looked at the SDSS spectra and we think those are wrong. So we think well, some of the SDSS. Estimations for estimations are also wrong. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, once you have millions of spectra, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so this um, once we make these cuts and as I mentioned before, that kind of defines our sample, which we'll then do some further uh, fixing of the redshift, etc. On um, we call our catalog Quaya. Which is a, a mash of quasars with unwise and Gaia. <laughs> oh, <laughs> working title, but I think got a good response, so we'll go with it. Um, and uh, we end up with um, 1.3 million quasars with G is less than 20.5. We, we cut out that 0.1 because we're going to use that as a buffer for some of our modeling. Um, and that still is 750. Okay, um, with G of less than 20, which is um, kind of a safer, cleaner sample, depending on your analysis, you might want to choose this. So, those are the numbers. Um, okay, now we're going to fix the redshifts. Uh, are there any other questions on the sample selection? Yeah? Why didn't you just cut out the Magellanic Cloud entirely, just in real space? Yeah. Uh, um, mostly because uh, that our catalog would have ugly looking holes in it. And but it already um, has a giant, <laughs> a giant hole. <laughs> 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 True. Um, so we recommend that for most analyses, you're probably going to want to mask them anyway. Um, our sample, actually, I think I should draw it. What ends up happening is we have we have our big hole in the middle. Um, we actually have. Now a slight under density around the LMC in our catalog because we <coughs> either we overcorrected a little bit by cutting out things that you know were too much like the MCs, or the MC is actually blocking quasars. Um, and you know, with source crowding, we don't see quasars there. Um, so either way, it gets a little bit messy. But uh, it was also like a helpful metric to think about uh, what you know, making sure we're cutting out enough of the other stars and galaxies. Um, but we were just trying hard not to have more cuts than necessary in the catalog and do that in post class too. Okay, and from an engineering perspective, it is good to try to work in the hardest parts of the sky because if you get the hardest parts of the sky pretty good, you know you're going to get the good parts of the sky very good. So, from an engineering perspective, it's the right choice to leave them in. <coughs> Even though, when you're a cosmologist, you're going to cut them. So we have a few minutes to fix the redshift. Um, we um, also can use this uh, WISE information, uh, not just to clean out contaminants, but to help us with the redshifts. Um, because what might happen is you have some uh, spectrum of a quasar that looks like this. Um, and Gaia um, only sees this part in the 
visible part of the spectrum. So maybe you, you know, measured the redshift from this single line, but you accidentally thought it was magnesium when it was carbon or something. Um, and then what happens is you can observe with uh, Ys over here um, and see that, oh, there's another emission line here. Um, you know, if it was, if this was carbon, it wouldn't have this other emission line over here, for example. Uh, so this has to be the other one. So it helps us break it down our seeds and figure out what the true redshift is. Um, so we can use that information uh, to our advantage. So we input um, the colors in both Gaia and Wise. Um, and we also can use um, Gaia's redshift estimate, which while I showed you isn't great, it still um, is a good start for what the possible redshift is. Um, we also include the magnitude and uh, an estimate of the dust value at the location of the quasar. So, because sorry, you must have said this. I just didn't assimilate it. How what, how good are the redshifts of unwise or wise? Oh, so it only has photometry, so it doesn't even. Okay. Uh, unwise doesn't not natively have redshifts. There are people that get photometric redshifts <coughs> using wise, often in combination with another uh, survey like pan stars, um, and they are a bit worse than ours. Or so anyway, if you worse. use it, you have it, and otherwise you're. Using this for yeah, so we use it as additional information. Um, it's not particularly useful just by itself. Um, so these are our features. Um, and then we're going to try uh, to learn our true redshifts, which are provided by SDSS, as those are ground truths. Um, so we're going to try to train a model that goes from this information to SDSS. Um, and uh, the, we tried a whole bunch of models to try to learn this, some fancier machine learning, but what ended up working the best was a pretty simple model we like to call K-nearest neighbors. Um, so the idea of a K-nearest neighbors model um, is that if we have some uh, distribution of features, so um, just like pick two of the features here that they're gonna, um, each, each point here is like a, a known Quasar with a SDSS redshift in in two features, pick whichever you want. Um, and then if we take our quasar with an unknown redshift and say it falls right here in this feature space, then we're going to take um, so figure out its nearest neighbors in the distance space defined by these features. Um, and then we're going to say that uh, the redshift of this source is uh, the median value of the redshifts of the K, in this case, K is five uh, nearest neighbors. So this is pretty simple algorithm, easy to understand, um, but it actually works really well because objects that are close in feature space end up having the same red, or you can tell the redshift from them, so we can learn really well from SDSS. Um, this isn't perfect mm -hmm. if you have, you know, we might um, go outside the bounds of our training set a bit, but it does its best, and we can also estimate errors pretty robustly. Um, so uh, the results end up looking like use all four features, right? Not just the two that you show on the board. Yeah, yeah. So this is just a so I can't draw in like nine dimensions. Um, yeah, and there's more than four because there's um, we use five different colors. Okay. That's why I said nine. I guess that's eight. Um, so we can uh, draw the results of this in terms of um, the the error in Z again, which I'm going to write in a slightly different way this time. Little delta Z is uh, the, the redshift we estimate minus the SDSS redshift over one plus SDSS redshift. Um, and then this is the probability that a source has uh, less than, has a, a delta redshift less than this. Um, and this is 10 to the negative 4, this is all the way up 1, and then negative 2. Um, so this is like a really bad redshift error, catastrophically bad. This is a really precise one, like as good as Sloan, nearly. Um, and so with um, Gaia, the, like the initial redshifts assigned to Gaia, these ones, um, it looks something like this. This is one, this is zero, this is around 0.8. Um, 
So what happens with Gaia is it's got a lot of really precise redshift, like a good portion of them, like nearly 80%. Once we made all these cuts, that's why I got better from 60%. Um, are like really precise down to like 10 to the minus two, minus three. Um, but it's got a whole population of you, like the other 20% are like catastrophically wrong, more than like 0 0.1, 0 0.1 wrong. Um, and so what we did with our method, or the results of our method, look something like this, that we correct a lot of these really wrong ones, but it's not as precise down at this end. So this is our, our area of improvement, where now um, we have a lot of ones where we can fix the edges here, um, but we're less precise here. So we come up with a simple way of kind of combining the best of both worlds here with a simple smoothing scheme, um, because when our results agree with um, Gaia, they're probably right, so we can take the more precise one is the logic. So we end up with something that's kind of like this. So that's our, what we call Z, SPZ, our spectral photometric redshifts, because it includes the Gaia spectroscopic information plus our um, additional photometric information. Um, but you so, could call it Z quia in principle, given the way you're. You're right, maybe we should switch to Z quia. Um, to put some numbers on it, what ends up what we end up getting is the number of catastrophic errors in in this iteration of the catalog, um, with greater than 0 0.2 in Gaia was 18 percent, so not as bad as the 36 percent as before because it helped by doing all these uh, other cuts I made, um, and then Quaya gets it down to six percent, so a three percent reduction in these really sorry a three times reduction in these really bad redshifts uh, for uh, 0.1, it was 19, and now it's 10. Uh, and for the really precise 0.01s, we actually make it slightly worse because of what I showed you here, uh, but it still didn't get much worse. Um, so we fixed the redshifts by a lot. So before, if we had like nearly 20% uh, redshifts that were super wrong, that's tough to do any real cosmology with. But if you have 94% of them right, you can actually do some reasonable cosmological analyses. Cool. Um, okay. Well, figure out which of the things I was going to tell you are most exciting. Um, maybe I will skip the selection function and jump to catalog comparison and some cosmo cosmological. How results. many quizzes did you have? In SDSS? Uh, I'm about to write that. Okay. Um, so, just a quick catalog comparison between Quaya and SDS and um, EBOS. So, that's the SDSS4 campaign of it. Uh, was um, in terms of the number. We have, as I said, 1.3 million with our magnitude cut. Um, EBOS has about 350,000. Correct me if I'm wrong. That might be between particular redshift rates. I think that's the most important. That's the that's EBOS specifically. That's EBOS. Yeah. The total for SDSS is 750,000. With much better redshifts. With much better redshifts, yeah. So lower number is much better redshifts. Um, the sky area, um, quiet gets all of the sky mm -hmm. except. Not really because of that dust area. So if you exclude like super dusty regions, we end up with about 70% of the sky. Um, EBOS has 12% of the sky. Um, and SDSS has like 25% of the sunlight. Um, Sounds about right. And uh, we can calculate. Maybe a little less. Uh, maybe a little less than being nice to SDSS. Uh, we can calculate some effective volume. So these cover actually a pretty similar redshift range in the end after our corrections. Um, the redshift distribution is fairly similar. So it actually spans a volume of, you can scale it by kind of a similar area ratio. It spans a much larger volume, but um, we have a lower number density because we have uh, you know, more quasars, but they're still really spread out among across the volume. So our effective volume is not as much different, but it's still better. So I calculated and maybe it's like some other cosmologists to check this at some point. 
um, is that we span an effective volume of 8 gig parsecs per h cubed. So this isn't a real volume, it's um, scaled by the number density, um, whereas EBOS is closer to 5, maybe 3 to 4. That's maybe. like at the BAO scale? That's... Yeah, that's at a particular scale that's okay. like around in yeah. okay. BAO scale. So take that with a grain of salt. But to give you some idea, even with our lower number density, because we have such large volume and, and large number, we still um, have a really good effective area. Um, and then there's also, I didn't list here, but like photometric surveys have uh, way, or not way more, but have like a similar number um, of quasars uh, that span all sky, um, but they're less precise redshift, so they're not as useful for certain analyses. Um, okay, and then I wanted to get a little more into the details of my, the preview I gave you at the beginning about constraining primordial non gap identity in my last four minutes. Um, Uh, so, what happens here is, um, this is also related to the comparison of EBOS, um, is, as I explained before, we have um, the CMB, um, it's like shining to us, but distorted by um, the intervening large scale structure, um, we call that lensing convergence, not kappa, um, and then if we see through our is our catalog here, um, and we can we expect these to be correlated because this is made by the large field structure that this traces, um, so that's correlated, um, and we can model um, this correlation as some um, uh, yields um, cross correlation between the lensing and the quasars, um, and so be the, the one equation I write for you today, um, is an integral over the co-moving distance chi uh, with some uh, lensing kernel for the uh, sorry, kernel for the lensing, uh, projection kernel for the lensing and different projection kernel uh, for the quasars. Um, and then it has some bias terms. So this is the bias I talked about earlier. Um, but what happens um, if you have primordial non-Gaussianities is you'll get a scale-dependent bias. So, um, and this is a matter power spectrum. Um, so that bias can be parameterized in terms of FNL. Um, and so when we calculate this cross-correlation, we can compare it to models and then constrain. This is also the function of FNL in here. I won't write it out. Um, we can constrain this primordial non gaussianity um, and this Meaning also, that that bias would not be a function of of k. That that b of k and z that's like a wave number and a redshift. Yeah. So and it would have no it would have no function of wave number if there was no non gaussianity. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The scale dependent bias is because of that. I see. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um. Let's see right again. Um. One second. Yeah. One minute? Okay. <laughs> then I will just tell you the result here, um, which is that um, even without correcting for the selection function, which is what I kind of threw there with the dust and stars but didn't tell you that in detail, um, this is our theoretical model of the CLs. Um, Gaia is uh, mostly right on the curve on the expected theory without any selection function correction, whereas if you but EBOS and don't correct for the selection, it looks like this. So one really nice thing about our sample is that we already have a better understanding of the selection because of the you know clean all skyness of, of Gaia. When we do correct for it, we end up with something that is more reasonable for both surveys, but Gaia is open circle. Gaia has uh, smaller error bars. Um, and so that's kind of a vision, is whereas EBOS, the first spin here is a mess in the lower L's. Um, and these other ones are still a bit bigger. So that just explains why we're able to get um, our sigma an FNL of 20 uh, from Gaia, from Gaia, which is my name. Um, so this will be coming out uh, soon. I just want to write up here. The data is already on our NYU website if you want to play with it, and it'll be formally released uh, soon as well as the companion analysis 
papers. Uh, so I'm gonna make it over here for you. Okay, cool. That's all, thank you. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> when you have, if you pull that the board down, so you, you've got your quiet quasars, and then there's the EBOS quasars and the SDSS quasars. Uh, if I look at them and I think about the intersections and find the things which are not in the intersections, is there anything to learn from the ones that you missed that they got or that you got that they missed that you could have in principle? Yes, um, and we've been talking about this for a long time. I think we started a little analysis of it, but uh, didn't actually follow through. But definitely there are things like SDSS has a strong color selection in their quasars, so they're gonna miss a lot of the super red quasars that will be found in Gaia. That was an interesting population to study because we just don't have observations of them. Other differences that we expect to be in both but are not, so only one or the other would be interesting because that means there's additional selection effects we don't know about. Anyone else wanna add things to that? There's also changing look, quasars disappear. It would be really cool if some of the stone quasars disappeared <coughs> or new quasars appeared that, quasar, that stone should have seen. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of interesting things there. Actually, Eiler's on our team. That's kind of her direction. Her direction. But I didn't want to do a project. Like yeah, we have tons of projects. We also found some lensed quasars. Everybody wants to look at lenses. So we've got some cool stuff. How many lens quasar candidates do you have? Uh, we, we don't have a very specific number because there's different things you can do. But one of the things you expect with quasars is the very most luminous quasars should generally be lensed. So the first thing we did on zero day when the data came out was look at the brightest things that were classified as quasars. Of course, most of them were trash. Then we figured out how to do some of those cuts and then some of the remaining ones looked like their lenses and all the famous lenses appeared among the most luminous. So we believe we have a ton of lens quasars, at least dozens. In okay. bad year two, there was only, there was like order of two dozen. So okay. maybe it's more. Yeah. Than that. So I have a different question. When you did your nearest neighbor analysis, how do you do a metric on such different uh, <laughs> quantities? Yeah. Um, so we we spent some time messing with this metric, but these a lot of these have kind of similar like all the colors are all you know similar scales. Um, and so it ended up, yeah, these, there are some of the three different scales, but ended up not mattering that much, which I was surprised by. Like if you rescaled all of them to normal distribution or, uh, or if you just used the raw ones, it didn't actually end up making much difference, which I was a little surprised by, because you might think um, it would, but I guess they're, um, you know, the features, you know, among themselves are distinguishing enough that Uh, for information, uh, some of the uses of quasars, uh, cosmology with quasars, one of the items that you listed was uh, dark matter halos. Is there anything you can say at this point on dark matter halos based on quasars? Yeah, so one of the things that we haven't done yet with this catalog, but you can learn is um, based on the bias of quasars, what the minimum mass of a dark matter halo is that hosts quasars, because they'll tend to be in the really biased ones. So we know that. Um, halos of around three times 10 to the 12 solar masses post quasars. Uh, and but that number is not very well constrained, so that's something to do with these upcoming surveys. Uh, but we're you looking for more than that. Also, the amplitude of the cross correlation with the lensing map in some sense tells you something about the quasar dark matter cross correlation function. I haven't thought about it, but something about that amplitude. Is that amplitude rigid, or did you? The amplitude there, I mean, that fit, what free parameter did Julio have? Because I think it has some dark matter properties in it, right? Yeah, there's some uh, like free parameters in the bias. I, I think the bias somehow connects to the dark matter quasar yeah. cross correlation. Yeah. But anyway, there might be more detailed information about it. But a lot, a lot is, that correlation is set, as Kate said, by that minimum mass primarily. In conventional cosmology. Yeah. All right, let's thank Kate again. I'm sorry.
Thanks for saying that. It doesn't matter.